Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS. Great, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Lewis. Uh, thank you for joining us at this event that CSIS and the Information Technology Industry Association are doing on open radio access networks, ORAN, and their implications for next generation networks, 5G and 6G. Uh, it's a good topic. It's got a lot more attention than uh, in the past. So we have three real experts with us to speak today. Uh, first is Chris Boyer, Vice President of Global Security and Technology Policy at AT&T. Um, many of you know Chris, he's been active in this field for a while. He is uh, AT&T's experts on these issues and also advises the National Security Telecoms Advisory Committee, which should I say that or not, but Chris is very active in the field. We have Diane Rinaldo, who has long experience. You know her as the former head of NTIA, uh, and now uh, someone who is the director of the Open RAN Policy Coalition uh, with uh, long experience in Washington and Capitol Hill. I always get nervous when I say long experience because it makes you seem like you're going to be old, but you'll just have to put up with it. Um, you, long experience for both Chris and Diane, for people who are so youthful. <laughs> and then our final speaker is Rochelle Salabrizi, director, director, pardon me, director of government relations at VMware. Um, she has been on the Hill. She has been in the administrative branch, and she worked at Cruise, which is weirdly enough one of my favorite companies. So, uh, three expert panelists. What I've asked them to do is talk about um, ORAN, talk about uh, how it will affect the rollout of 5G. Um, you know, in our previous event, we talked about it's not too soon to say, say 6G. People are already doing research, so we need to think about that. But I've asked them each to give five minutes or so of opening remarks, and then we'll go to Q&A uh, from me and, of course, from you, the audience. You please use the chat function to ask Q&A, and we will um, we will take it from there. Uh, Rochelle, I think we were going to start with you. Is that okay? 
Great. Well, thank you so much to CSIS and ITI and my fellow panelists, Diane and Chris. Uh, very excited to be here today uh, to talk about this important topic. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with VMware, our mission is to deliver the trusted foundation to accelerate innovation. As a leading provider of multi-cloud services for all apps, VMware's technologies power the world's digital infrastructure. With VMware products used at 99% of Fortune 1000 companies across every industry and every government. Where you may be more familiar with VMware is our pioneering work in virtualization, which is a core principle of cloud computing that simplified and transformed the data center. Now we've leveraged that expertise and applied those same groundbreaking principles of optimization, automation, and software innovation to the advance, advancement of 5G and open radio access networks, or open RAN. In telecom today, over 10% of the global cell phone traffic goes through VMware software via our partnerships with global mobile service providers who are virtualizing their network functions for a 5G enabled world. In addition, we've announced a partnership with DISH here in the United States to deliver 5G telecommunication services based on those open radio access network technologies. Uh, one of the things that I think we talked a little bit about uh, in, in our prep call is just what is open radio access networks and why are we talking about this? So I'll go ahead and give it a, a quick uh, intro and then I would look to Chris and Diane to come in and you know, correct anything or add any information. But what we're really talking about here is the radio access network, which today is a single proprietary piece of hardware, radio and software all combined into one. And what we're doing in Open RAN is simply opening it up, making it open and interoperable, decoupling that hardware and software function, allowing for fully disaggregated radio access networks that can be broken down into its component parts and then automated in a cloud native software defined fashion. Uh, so I hope I didn't use too many technical terms, but simply what we're trying to do is open up this last piece of, of closed proprietary technology and make sure that we are innovating and offering those opportunities for a multi-vendor ecosystem that's going to allow us to accelerate not just 5G rollout, but 6G rollout as well. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, Diane, would you please speak next? Great. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm actually in um, LA for Mobile World Congress. So thank you to one of our members letting me borrow their meeting space. So the conference is happening around me. So you might hear some very excited telecom people looking at new product lines. Um, so I actually was just on a panel and talking about the first time I heard about the concept of Open RAN. When I was at NTI, I spent a lot of time focused on 5G, working with um, my coworkers to, to figure out how do we best deal with the issue and the ongoing concern of not only the US government, but governments around the world of vendor diversity. What happens if we wake up one day and there's only one player in this market? So one day I was in a meeting and a coworker came in with a PowerPoint talking about open RAN. It's like, this is, this is what we need. Not only does it solve that issue that we have been grappling with with vendor diversity, it's also about innovation. It's also about competition. The barrier for entry into this market has been so high for so long because if you're an engineer and have a great idea on a radio, are you really gonna put all your efforts when you can only sell to a handful of companies? Well, now if you disaggregate the network, if you make it more modular, all of a sudden you're gonna have a wider market. So you don't have to sell to one of the current vendors. You can go directly to AT&T. You can go directly to an enterprise or a private network. And so what we've seen in the past couple of years that I've been working on this is an explosion of startups in this space, which is gonna drive that innovation, the competition, and hopefully bring down prices at the end of the day. Uh, so in, in our work in 18 months at the coalition, it's been an amazing um, catch for so many different industries, whereas the coalition really represents the entire mobile ecosystem. Not everyone's a vendor, but everyone understands that the health of the ecosystem relies on the entire ecosystem. So when we first launched this with Chris Boyer, my colleague on this project who's, going, who's speaking next, we were thinking just domestically, but we've actually launched an international effort as well. We wanna make sure that we are building those relationships internationally and collaborating with our partners around the world. Um, so Open RAN, well, we talk about Open RAN because we're all talking about 5G right now. It's really gonna impact in, 
other developing parts of the world, 3G, 4G, and as we look to 6G as well, you know, it's important from a policymaker's point of view to start talking about these issues now um, and to get ahead of it because 6G is going to our race up on us um, sooner rather than later. Great, thank you, Diane. And I hope we can come back to some of those themes uh, in the Q&A section, but uh, Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me uh, once again to talk about ORAN. Um, I really wanted to focus my initial comments really on, on three general areas. So first off, you know, how did we get to ORAN or, or where did it come from, first off? Then second, secondly, kind of what does it do? And then third, kind of why does it matter from a policy and national security perspective? So I'll try to just give a really brief uh, focus on each one of those three topics. So in terms of ORAN and, and, and you know, kind of how we got to this place, I think it's really important that the audience understands that ORAN is not something that was developed from a political reason. It's really, it's something that's been under development for several years. Um, you know, if you go back to some of the INSTAC reports that we've written, we've highlighted this point, but there's been a trend uh, with the networking towards what we call software defined networking. And this really started over a decade ago. And the, the basic takeaway here is that in the past, communications companies would deploy physical equipment for different functions in the network. While today, those functions are now shifting to software. The trend there started in the core of communication networks, but it's now being pushed uh, further and for, further out into the network. So ORAN is really a natural extension of that development. So the industry has been driving to ORAN for the past several years. And there's a lot of benefits that come from moving, to, moving away from kind of traditional physical equipment to more virtualization and more software-defined networking. But that was really the business driver behind ORAN. Um, what does ORAN do? I think uh, Michelle touched on that a little bit already, but essentially what it does is it standardizes and opens up the interfaces between the various components of the, of the radio access network. So if you think of the radio access network as basically radios, um, hardware, baseband, and software, basically the various interfaces that, that link those together to create an integrated system, traditionally were proprietary. So if you, if you built out a a wireless network, you would build a Nokia-based network or an Ericsson-based network or what have you, and everything was proprietary to one particular vendor. Uh, the radio was integrated into that solution with the hardware, with the software. Um, with ORAN, by standardizing those interfaces, we can now, as an operator, we can start to mix and match components from multiple vendors. Um, so last part of my initial comment, why does that matter? So from a policy and national security perspective, I think if you look at uh, the trajectory that we've been on in telecommunications equipment for the past um, several years, we've seen a consolidation of vendors. Um, and uh, we saw that really in the radio access part of the network in particular, there were limited options. There was really Nokia, Ericsson, uh, Samsung entering the market. And then of course we had the elephant in the room, which was the large Chinese companies that provide equipment. And so the idea behind ORAN, the, or what, one, of the, one of the benefits of ORAN, one of the things it can enable is by making it easier for different players to enter the ecosystem, um, it can lower barriers to entry and we can start to create a longer tail of suppliers than what we currently have today. Uh, so if you think about it now, if you wanted to enter the business and compete and provide equipment, you, had to build, you have to build a fully integrated uh, stack of equipment. You have to provide the hardware, the software, the radio, et cetera. That's an enormous investment. It takes a long time and it's, and it's unclear you know, as to whether or not the, that new entrance in that space can really compete. With ORAN, by standardizing the interfaces, now all someone has to do is innovate on the radio space or the software space, or we can run um, our networks on uh, on COTS, you know, commonly off-the-shelf hardware. So it changes the dynamic of how the industry functions. And I think at the end of the day, the, the benefit there is we can expand the universe of suppliers, which in my view, it ties into the, the, the national security and policy space because it takes us away from a dependency on a small subset of vendors to a much larger pool, which is good for innovation, um, and frankly, because the U.S. Is, is so far ahead in a lot of these areas, it's good for the country as a whole in terms of uh, investments in, in newer technology. So, so I think that's where the national security angle comes into play. Well, that raises uh, two questions for me. Uh, one is uh, neutral and one isn't. Uh, but you brought it up. What are the core components for ORAN? Uh, Rochelle told us what it is, but... What do you need to make an uh, ORAN and how does that fit in with the larger 5G network? Well, I mean, so uh, obviously you need to have radios that access the spectrum, right? So the radio is the first component. And then from the radio unit to what would be called um, 
uh, a DU or distribute. It's, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. But from the radio unit to the hardware, you have an interface that's uh, that's basically um, what was called a CIPRI or an eCIPRI interface. It's basically a piece of fiber that links the radio to the hardware. Um, but the specification for that traditionally has been proprietary to a particular vendor. Uh, what the ORAN Alliance is trying to do in its specifications is come up with the with an open, what's called a quote unquote open front hall interface that basically would allow for uh, a mix an interface between that radio and the and the hardware so that you can start to mix and match radios from different vendors with different hardware and of course the software that runs over the top of that um, is is another aspect of it that can also be um, done in a lot of different ways it could be you could use open source software you could use proprietary software uh, there's lots of different ways you could engineer a solution but the idea with open ran is because the interfaces are open and standardized um, there's a lot of different ways you can configure the network using different suppliers. And if you look, and Diane could, can speak to this, uh, if you look at the coalition members, there's different vendors playing to different solutions. Like in Japan, Rakuten has a solution where they're partnering with Altio Star and they're, and they're using, uh, I think, um, some NEC and even some Nokia equipment in their configuration. If you look at what DISH is doing in the US, they're using Mavenir and VMware and some others. So just depending upon where you are, that gives you an idea of uh, the mixing and matching of components and kind of building in a multi-vendor environment. I don't know, Diane, if you want to add to that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, no, not at all. I, I would just say, I think it's a great point that you mentioned, Chris, um, that open RAN, while, while some focus on that, you know, we're kind of filling that hole of, of a diversified marketplace, but it really is injecting new um, innovation ingenuity into the markets, into the networks. It's really changing the way we look at the structure and um, how we view the G's moving forward with a layered approach. And as you move on, you know, no longer do you have to wait for that 10 year refresh that you can layer on applications um, as you go. And one of the things I was uh, hoping to get, which I think you guys have done and Rochelle, maybe you'll want to add on it is sometimes you hear, I just uh, spoke to uh, someone on Capitol Hill who said that uh, the U.S. is behind on 5G, and some people see ORAN as a silver bullet to uh, fix that. I'm not sure we are behind on 5G, and if, as Chris said, the key components are software and semiconductors, um, where do we stand? So is ORAN a silver bullet, uh, and do we need a silver bullet? I, I don't know who wants to start first on Maybe Diane, since this is... So I would say that nothing's a silver, silver bullet in life. Um, I believe, and, and Chris, correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, 97% of the United States has access to 5G at this point. Um, we are certainly not behind. We are leading in innovation. The United States continues to be a place where people want to come and innovate, and that's a really important part of this. Um, but yeah, we need to make sure that Open RAN, um, that us as a coalition, we keep advocating for policies that can help bring it to scale you know, there's no doubt in my mind that Open RAN is the future. Um, it's just bringing it to scale at this point. And I'll just chime in. I think, you know, what we've seen with Open RAN is that opportunity for innovation. The RAN is really the last piece of the telecommunications network that hasn't been virtualized, that hasn't been software defined, that hasn't moved into this uh, new and innovative space. And so what Open RAN does is, well, it's not necessary strictly for 5G, it's definitely gonna help us roll out and accelerate 5G in a, in a faster manner. And it's gonna help us form the basis for 6G. And one of the ways that we're seeing, you know, that constant innovation today, you know, I guess going back to the, the question of, are we behind? Uh, I would say, no, we're innovating very quickly. You know, at Mobile World Congress, where Diane is today, we announced uh, earlier this week that we are, uh, we have a product for the radio intelligent controller the, or the RIC, and we are launching X apps and R apps. And I don't think that we're ready to get into, you know, all of the technical work of what that means. But what the, the exciting part about it is it opens up the RAN to third party vendors to write applications in a way that we've never seen before. And that's going to drive not just multi-vendor uh, opportunities for the radio access network itself, but the applications that are gonna run on it. And so that's things like localization, prioritization, you know, things we haven't really been able to do before via software. Yeah, I'll just say like, I, I would concur, you know, we certainly don't think 
the U.S. is behind China. You know, I, you know, all, all the major operators in the U.S. are making major investments in 5G uh, to ensure that we can cover the you know large swath of the country, and we're we're seeing that today. And there's been you know the spectrum auctions. If if you've seen what's been going on there, obviously the prices have gone really high. People are clearly investing in 5G. So I don't feel like we're behind China at all. And I think I think Michelle makes a, makes a great point about or Rachel, I'm sorry makes a great point about the X apps and those types of things. Those are really critical developments for Open RAN for entities like an AT&T, right? Because we have a lot of different customers that we, we have to support, uh, the ability to have applications that we can deploy for things like prioritization and those types of elements that can span across vendors, right? Is something that is really important to the success of Open RAN. So I think there's a ton of development going on and I, I would challenge the premise that we're behind on 5G. That doesn't mean, but I don't want to make it sound like the government doesn't need to make an investment uh, in Open RAN because we certainly are still supporting that as well. Because I think there's still things that can be done, you know, through um, through uh, government policies that would help advance the technology. So I think it's a it's a so it's not that we're behind. Uh, I think we're we're doing really well on 5G, but uh, there's still some places where, especially in terms of like enhancing R and D and other types of development on Open RAN, the government still has a role to play, and that's what we've been advocating for. So I, I have to do it, but keep the answer short. Maybe just one of you. Uh, we brought up XApp. Uh, if you had asked me before this call, I'd say XApp is what an X-Men has on his phone. What is an XApp? <laughs> uh, Rochelle, you brought it up. Why don't we tag you with it? Uh, basically, it's the application on the RIC that is the centralized RIC uh, or the distributed RIC. So X apps and R apps are the, the way that you're gonna write the software to control them. And uh, any mistakes are my own engineers, don't write me, sorry. <laughs> we have two well, sets lay of people here, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're we interpreting two... a lot of very complex topics into a short discussion, so. That's right, it's gotta fit on a bumper sticker. We have two right. sets of questions. One is on US policy. Uh, as it relates to innovation and research, and one is on international uh, activities to support ORIM. Let me do the international stuff first. One of the questions is, um, how do we work best with companies in uh, friendly nations uh, when it comes to ORAN? And Diane, I'm gonna pick on you. Can you talk about what you've been asked to do with the Quad? Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Um, so the Quadrennial is a 60, 70 year alliance between the United States, Australia, India, and Japan. At a recent meeting several weeks ago, um, the Open RAN Policy Coalition was tasked to, do, to serve as a secretariat. So we are coordinating the four countries, associations in those countries to do what is called the Track 1.5 Dialogue. Um, and so we are currently putting it together right now. So I have nothing to share on what the actual do outs will look like. Um, but, you know, we're excited about getting back in person and looking at different opportunities where we can work more closely with um, our allies from the quad and then in turn have uh, something to share with other countries as well. So it's quite an honor to be chosen. All right. Um one of the things that we've heard, I don't know, Rochelle or Chris, if you want to add to that, but uh, of course there's some tensions uh, involved in the deployment and development of ORAN. And so one of the things that we've heard is that there are some who fear that Europe will be unable to compete in the next generation of networks and that ORAN is actually uh, an industrial policy designed to provide advantage to American companies. Um, I'm not making that up. That's, I just heard this. Uh, what would you say back? I mean, what's the role of the Europeans? Where are they strong? Um, how will we work with them? Uh, Chris, do you wanna start? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I, I don't agree with that at all. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, ORAN was started as a technology development and there are many European operators who are very engaged in ORAN. If you look at the membership of our Open RAN Policy Coalition. We have companies like Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone. Um, you can go over into, into uh, India where we have Badia. You can go to Japan where we have NTT and Rakuten. Um, you know, it's all over the world, right? So uh, the idea that that ORAN is some sort of U.S. initiative to displace the Europeans, I think, is, is just not true. 
Um, and frankly, from a, from a, from, and I don't want to speak for the policy coalition. I'll let Diane speak to this, but our, our general sense is, look, what we're looking for is a, is a broadened supply chain, right? And having more innovation in the supply chain for communications equipment. And quite frankly, if that happens, if that comes from Europe, if the existing incumbent uh, providers out there like Nokia and Ericsson embrace that approach, more power to them, right? That's, that would be a good outcome for an operator like us. And, and at the same time, we'd like to see innovation from American-based companies. So what we're really looking for here is innovation, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be geographically, geographically specific in my view. I'll just say that the you know the Europeans are clearly leading in, in a lot of aspects in, in terms of the operators who are looking at Open RAN. You know, earlier this year, Deutsche Telekom, Telefonica, Orange, Vodafone, and Tim all signed an MOU talking about the specifications that were going to be necessary to move to an Open RAN environment. So they're clearly thinking about it and they're clearly working on it. Uh, VMware, we have a partnership with, with Vodafone where we're working on a number of different initiatives to roll out and incorporate Open RAN and massive. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I think we can talk about this later, but we also see European investment in 6G R&D and in, in Open RAN. So uh, of the 2 billion euros of COVID relief funds in Germany that were earmarked for technology, you know, there's a, a portion that's specifically earmarked for working on Open RAN. And there's another 700 million euros that Germany made available for 6G R&D. Also earlier this year, we heard that the UK it has a 30 million pound federal R&D funding for Open RAN that they're calling Future RAN. And they've also launched a Smart RAN Open Network Interoperability Center. So obviously there's a lot that's going on in this space. You know, that's the European focus. To Chris's point, you know, we've got a lot going on throughout the world, but because the, the question was sort of framed as, you know, what can, what, what, what's going on in Europe, uh, you know, th there's a lot is the answer. Great. Diane, you want to add anything? Yeah, if I could, thank you. Um, I would just say there's nothing that could be further from the truth. From the coalition's point of view, um, our mission is to bring more competition in this space, not less. We want to open the aperture. And the new members that have come on board as of, as of recently um, are all international members. So they add a lot to our organization and we enjoy um, working with the different countries around the world on these issues. I, I should probably point out that when this was described to me, the term used was not American, it was Anglosphere. But if I say that, maybe it gives away the source. Um, there are some in Congress who have asked about Chinese participation in the ORAN Alliance. And is that a legitimate concern? How do we manage the involvement of Chinese companies? I would say from the coalition standpoint, we're, we're not associated with the Alliance. Um, we have our own charter and structure. In the charter, it says that we cannot have any participants that reside on any ban list. Um, and another, another big factor of joining is that you have to actually be supportive of Open RAN. We wanna make sure that um, we are all in it together, kind of pushing that boulder uphill. Um, I, I know for standards reasons, the US government has long been supportive of working with everyone involved in the mobile ecosystem, understanding that interoperability is absolutely necessary. Um, and there are certain precautions that may need to be taken and are accounted for and are taken, um, but that interoperability is important, so. Okay. Um, there are Chinese companies that are trying to develop ORAN technology. So um, where would you say they fit into this? Uh, there's stories about effects of the big Chinese telco equipment makers. Are they in ORAN? Are they involved? Are they, are they doing their own open radio access technologies? No well, one's I, approached us. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Go, 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 go ahead. You go first. No, no, no. I was just going to say no one's approached us to join our organization. Um, I haven't heard too much. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, open RAN is the future. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me that there are others that were looking to get into this space. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you go back to what I was saying initially, that, you know, Open RAN is just, a net, and I think uh, Rachel also touched on this, you know, that that really what Open RAN is doing is taking the same trends that have been occurring elsewhere in the network and kind of pushing them out to the radio access part of the network. And so, you know, there shouldn't be any surprise that, you know, Chinese operators would have the same interest in that from a technological perspective as would anyone else that's operating a major network, right? That this is just kind of the trend in the industry. So, I don't think we should be surprised that, that Chinese firms would be looking into 
open ran because it didn't start as a geopolitical issue. It started as a as a technological issue of how do we really advance networks into the future and, and really make them much more flexible and more innovative and, and frankly more like IT infrastructure, right? So that's so that's really what's been going on for years. The fact that it's that it's happening in China should be no surprise to anyone, I don't think. Yeah, we um, maybe that's a good lead in though to the the broader question of the implications for security of ORAN, uh, because some people raise this, and you get you get some people saying it will be better, some people saying it will be worse. What how will ORAN affect security on the network? Uh, I don't know who wants Rachel, Rachel. Do you want to do that first? Sure, and uh, obviously, you know, I think we all have a lot to say here. But I think this also ties into one of the common misconceptions about Open RAN, uh, because one of the things that we hear is, okay, you're opening up the interfaces, so you're opening up the attack surface. But what you're also doing is actually increasing security because you're shining a light on what was previously a closed box. No one could see in, no one could understand what was going on. So it doesn't mean that things weren't happening there, it just means we couldn't see them. And so through, uh, basically building on the security enhancements of 5G, what we're able to do is really look at all aspects of the network through Open RAN, again, through this software-defined open and interoperable network. And we're gonna be able to diagnose, remedy, and prevent problems at the edge where they start before they even get into the core, right? And so we're going to have these opportunities to actually detect much faster and through micro segmentation and a variety of other, you know, software uh, software innovations that that we have already in the in the core networks, we're going to be actually able to increase security. Um, and then on the multi vendor side of things, again, you're going to be able to select best of breed uh, applications. And so there's not just by shining a light on on open RAN uh, and, and looking inside the black box, are we going to be able to increase security? But we're going to be able to increase security through the innovation of all of the multi-vendors that are out there. And we're gonna be able to select the, 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 the folks who we think are, are gonna be best at that. So there's really a lot of different angles to this, but I'm sure there's, uh, there's more to, to add, Diane or, or Chris. Yeah, I think Rochelle, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, honestly. Like, I, got, I don't have a ton to add, but I think I think a couple of different ways you can think about this is that, you know, an open model doesn't just help with innovation, but it can also improve security and reliability. And I'll go back to some of the discussions we've had on things like open source by giving the global developer community access to underlying code, you know, vulnerabilities and holes can be identified and patched a lot faster than any one company can on its own. So it's almost like analogous to a 24 by 7 neighborhood watch program for network-based software. So there's benefits to having a more open environment there. Um, also, I think as you move to a more modular design, you know, with different providers or different suppliers providing different components of the network, that enhances, doesn't, it doesn't diminish security because it allows operators to more quickly react and replace or address kind of suspect equipment. Um, also, going back to the conversation about the radio intelligent RAN or the radio, the RIC, the radio intelligent controller, an intelligent RAN can enable us to deploy security capabilities a lot closer to the network edge which allows us to more quickly respond and address threats. So think of things like, you know, DDoS attacks that could happen where you might be able to detect them closer to the source um, as opposed to letting them traverse the entire network. So um, there's a lot of different things we can do, you know, leveraging the capability of, of an open architecture that we really, that, you know, that, that we do today, but we can do it on a different, to take it to a different level, I think, to a more advanced level, you know, as we deploy uh, an ORAN based um, architecture. Um, so I think, so I think while, Yes, you have to, you know, you obviously have to engineer security into your architecture, right? I'm not going to downplay the fact that security is dependent upon the operators building it into the network. No doubt we have to do that. But, but if that's done, there's, I think there's, there's some, there are definitely advantages to moving towards an open environment that, uh, that would come into play as well. So Diane, thumbs up or thumbs down, is this a plus or a minus for security? Or is it a draw? Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's, it's a plus. Um, 5G is infinitely more secure than 4G and open ran as Michelle and Chris um, perfectly laid out. You're allowing more eyes on the problem um, and it allows for opportunities for a greater enhancements in security. Uh, one of the questions on that, we've gotten a couple questions from the audience and uh, one of them is, um, what's the best way to encourage ORAN deployment? Uh, is it uh, mandates? Uh, is it subsidies? Is it just relying on market forces? 
uh, or is it some mix, right? And so that's, I think one of the key questions is that since some people do see ORAN as a silver bullet, you occasionally hear people talking about mandating faster deployment. So where do you guys come out on that? Mandate subsidy market. Chris, that's red meat for you. You should. You should. Yeah, I would say, <laughs> shockingly enough, at t does not support mandates of open. <laughs> no one should be, be should be surprised by that. Look, I, I'll just say this: um, there's there's going to be a lot of different use cases involved in 5G deployment, from enterprise 5G, private 5G networks, 5G networks that at t and, and the other big operators are deploying. You know, ultimately, it comes down to which architecture is going to be able to best serve. The customers and for the particular use cases that we're that we're looking towards. So, you know, the individual operators are going to know best what the performance requirements are and how to best serve their customers. And so, they need to be permitted. Um, we, we need to be permitted to be able to choose the technology that best meets those needs. So, that could involve a traditional architecture in some cases. It could involve an open architecture in other cases. It really depends. You know, I, I firmly believe that the industry is gradually going to migrate towards open RAN as ORAN matures. And so it's just going to take some time, but I, I fully expect it's going to happen. You know, and I think a lot of it's going to depend on the operators. Certain operators are going to move faster than others. They may have different use cases, different customer bases. They may have different performance criteria and requirements that they need to fulfill. And, you know, and it's not to say that ORAN solutions don't work today. It just means it may not be the right choice depending upon uh, what you're trying to achieve, but the operators are the ones ultimately who know you know, what, what their requirements are and deploying their networks. And so I, I, I think mandating a particular solution, you know, would be a bad idea um, giving, giving them, because there's, it, again, it goes back to, it's not the one size fits all, right? We're constantly doing comparison tests between network performance from different operators. If it was all the same, then that wouldn't even matter. So, so, so ultimately the engineers have to figure this out better for engineers and the operators and their, and our suppliers to figure it out than to have the government kind of dictate a solution. I'm gonna add a little bit of, of texture to what Chris was talking about because he was really taking uh, an incumbent operator sort of view. And what I'm thinking about is the $42.5 billion that the federal government is poised to invest in rolling out broadband to underserved areas in the United States. And so for opportunities like that, or the uh, nearly $2 billion that is currently going to small carriers in the United States, to replace their uh, untrusted equipment with new equipment. These are opportunities to build out our networks using open and interoperable interfaces that aren't going to come around again for another generation. And so when we're going into these, uh, these green fields and we're looking to build out in these underserved areas, we really need to be leveraging the innovation that we have today that 5G, 6G, 7G is going to be built on so that we have that in those areas and we're not in the same position 20 years from now saying, oh man, I wish we would have uh, you know, built those radio networks out uh, open and interoperable back in the day. Before Diane speaks, I have to say, this is a historic occasion because it's the first time anyone has said 7G on a CSI. <laughs> well, we'll get there. Yeah. I'm confident. Like, holy cow. I just got to 6G. Anyhow, uh, Diane, go ahead. <laughs> Great. Um, sorry, I, I'm, I'm using somebody else's space at Mobile World. Yeah. Um, so yes, we made a decision uh, when we first launched that we were not going to support mandates. Um, we believe this is happening organically and, and work with policymakers around the world to help advocate for policies that help advance the deployment of Open RAN. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are incredibly supportive of Senators Warner, Rubio, Schumer, Todd Young, who have advanced the USA Telecommunications Act into the US Competition and Innovation Act, which would allocate 1.5 billion to NTIA to help with research development um, of open RAN solutions. And then another half a billion, 500 million to the State Department to help our allies around the world in choosing a trusted vendor to build out their networks. Um, so we believe that this is an investment into development and investment into the future of uh, open RAN networks. That's actually one of the questions we got from the audience, which is somebody said, uh, Peru has a program called Internet para todos, uh, internet for everyone. Um, and the question is, it connects rural communities uh, using ORAN technologies is this something the US government should support? Should this be the kind of thing? You know, we've talked about clean networks here and we've talked about other stuff, not on this in the US. 
where should the U.S. be in helping development aid for ORAN in other countries, particularly friendly countries like Peru? Well, that, I think that's where the multilateral fund plays a really key role, right? Because the whole the whole concept there was to allow um, for money uh, to flow that would level the playing field, so that um, you know, uh, frankly, allied vendors, whether we're, you know whether they're open ran or otherwise, and, and specifically in this case for open ran supporting vendors could compete competitively with bids from other suppliers, and that was really the genesis of the multilateral fund. And I think, and I I, I personally think the multilateral fund is really just a down payment. It's really intended to signal support so that ultimately it can grow even further and hopefully other countries will make contributions to it as well. So I think between the multilateral fund and, and Diane can elaborate as we've had a lot of conversations with USAID and uh, the, the development financial corporation like the DFC and also with XM Bank and others. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of tools in the toolkit uh, that can help uh, level the playing field and enable the deployment of more um, open-based solutions internationally. And I think the U.S. between the State Department and those types of agencies, you know, has a key role to play there. Well, we got a great question from the audience on China, but before uh, we do that, um, I want to go back to something Diane said, especially because she's not paying attention. Um, I want to go back to something Diane said, which is, uh, well, actually, all of you said it, legislation which looks like it's going to pass uh, from what I hear probably maybe not this week but in next week um, legislation is going to give NTIA a hefty chunk of money if you were back at NTIA what would you do with that chunk of money and then I'd like Rochelle and Chris to critique your answer this is fun <laughs> okay not so you, just got, you just got so is this broadband million. money or is this is this broadband or is this the 1.5? The 1.5. 1.5? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the 42 and a half billion. <laughs> Let's see what she does with 1.5 <laughs> before we give her. Oh, okay. Do 1.5. Yeah. <laughs> well, first important? off, I want to congratulate Alan Davidson, who was nominated yesterday to be the next administrator of NTIA. Um, best job I ever had. So, you know, I wish him well. Um, and I know that he'll, he'll take great, great care of our folks and you know, it really is a family over there. Uh, as far as the funding, it's an amazing opportunity for them to direct um, up to $50 million for, per program to companies that can help with the development and deployment of Open RAN. Um, so I can see additional funding going into research, um, helping fund participation at standards bodies. I know that's been a big issue for members of Congress. How can we get greater participation of, at standards bodies? Um, so not only the research of how do we get the Lego pieces together now, but also in the future, how do we integrate new applications as they come online? And that's one of the big benefits of Open RAN is that you can uh, integrate as you go. You no longer have to wait for that life cycle to come around again. Um, so you know, they, they have a lot of uh, different options and opportunities to make a difference in this space, as well as working more collaboratively with our um, uh, colleagues around the world and companies around the world to, to truly show that this is a collaborative effort, um, bringing these different companies together to improve the functionality of our networks. Rochelle, you want to go first or want to go first? <laughs> I'll go ahead and, and start and, and then, you know, Chris, you can, can add. So obviously 100% agree with, with Diane that we need to be investing in the, this nascent industry. So a portion of the money needs to go to basically help to create that multi-vendor universe through startup incubators or, and, and that, uh, you know, things that are going to help us think about the next innovation that we're not even aware of yet. I think also a portion needs to go to that test bed uh, creation that, that Diane was talking about. Uh, the only way that open and interoperable works is if it's actually interoperable. And so we need those opportunities to be able to test out our, our, our innovation and make sure that it's working according to the standards with everything else. And so I think that those two uh, components of the 1.5 billion are, are really going to help the nascent industry that is uh, open radio access networks in, in the United States and abroad. Yeah, I, I agree with both. Diana and Michelle, I just build on that just slightly in that, you know, I think I think as far as test beds go, it, it's really important that we have some sort of integrated series of test beds that are looking at different aspects of open RAN 
Um, and there's lots of different things that you could deal with there, things such as ORAN power and environmental considerations. And there's been a lot of misnomers out there about the power and utilization of ORAN. I think there's ways to test and, and, and demonstrate the, the energy usage issues around open ran on the security side there's different security pieces that could that could be tested and and proven out in terms of you know virtualized vulnerability management virtualized network research ai assisted discovery visualization and hardening of the of the attack surface there's things that could be done there from a research perspective um you know testing around latency and scalability uh multi-vendor x apps or r apps you know different radio concepts uh, especially as we move into, you know, I know 6G sounds a long ways away, but when you move into 6G and you're talking about using like, you know, really, really high, high end spectrum, right? Then radio development is a major part of uh, the U.S. competitiveness of story. And then there's things like, um, you know, deploying, there's other things we could do like deploy open range into universities and, and do things around deployments um, and more coordinations of, of the various test beds that are out there. So I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, you know, um, just just in terms of, of testing and, and use cases and demonstrating value and, and even some deployments, right, some small scale deployments that could be done at universities and on military bases and, you know, with with um, uh, different in different um, enterprise business locations and things like that, um, in addition to what the network operators are doing. So I think there's that money can really go to good use to advance the technology in my from my perspective. One other thing we haven't really talked about, and I don't, I don't know that it strictly comes out of the 1.5 billion, but I think that we've talked about all of the ways that, that could be spent, but an important role that government has is as an aggregator and educator of best practices. I know this summer the FCC hosted an open RAN showcase, mostly aimed at those small carriers that are going to be part of the uh, $2 billion equipment replacement program, uh, commonly known as Rip and Replace. And those kinds of events where you know, maybe folks who are thinking about open RAN or have a lot of questions, not really sure how it all works, providing those best practices in one place, providing those opportunities to talk about how it's working, how, you know, what challenges there might be, and, and just the exposure and that education component, I think is a really key aspect that we haven't really talked about that, you know, may not even require a lot of, of funding, but does leverage a lot of what the federal government, at least in the United States, can help us facilitate. So that kind of fits into uh, one of the questions I got from the audience. And it's probably a bad sign that I think this is a great question. I'm going to split it into two parts. The first part is, um, will there be IP and licensing issues as we move into ORAN? Uh, the complicated answer. The second part is, if countries like China develop their own standards um, and then export them to say their Belt and Road customers, what does that mean for ORAN? So maybe we can, you can do both of them: IP and licensing issues, uh, standards issues. Where do we where do we come out on that? That's a hard one, but you don't want me yeah. to answer it. I want you to answer it. Chris, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on the IP and licensing. It's not something that we've really broached at the coalition before. Um, I, I don't see it having a, any more of a hurdle than current vendor um, hardware. I, I, don't, I don't see why it would have um, a, another hurdle compared to what's on the market now. I, I can look into it though. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a tough one to answer. I think, I think all standards bodies, it, most of them, at least in my experience, have some sort of IPR policy for how they're going to deal with that because people bring, you know, obviously when you're developing a standard, sometimes companies bring um, uh, contributions into the standards bodies that they have intellectual property rights for, um, and you have to deal with that issue. So um, I know that most of the standards bodies I've been involved with have all had some sort of policy around how to deal with IPR. So that's always a challenge. I don't know that it's insurmountable when it comes to open RAN. It's just something that, that you have to deal with. Um, as far as the second part of the question, I think, Jim, that you mentioned around China, I mean, that, that really goes to the, what we were talking about earlier, in my view, on the multilateral fund and trying to level the playing field. That's the concern, right? Is that, is that you know, that, that if the, what we don't want to see happen, and which frankly might be inevitable, I don't know, but, but if, the, if we split off into two standards worlds, right, and we have a Chinese version and a, and a Western version, right, and then the, and, um, and through Belt and Road in China 2025, they're able to, you know, kind of lock down, you know, big chunks of the, of the developing world, then then that kind of locks them in. And if they don't, and if they're not interoperable and they're not open, then it creates real challenges down the road. So I think, 
I think, um, you know, the multilateral fund is partially a way to level the playing field so that um, that that outcome doesn't happen. But um, that's tough because, you know, there's a lot of, you know, as you, you know, as well as I do that, um, you know, frankly, um, some of those, and again, I don't want to turn this into a, a China discussion, but there's obviously, but some of those locations are getting what I'll call, you know, um, offers that they can't refuse in some respects, right? Things that are a little too good that are not easily matched. And so I think that creates a challenge for uh, U.S. policy around how to deal with that. Okay, we're uh, coming up on the end of our time. So I've just got a couple more. Uh, one, they're related. Uh, does anyone want to be bold and give an estimate for the timeline on ORAN deployment? And I ask that in part because in private, when you talk to some service providers, they are skeptical or critical of uh, ORAN, uh, either in scalability or in reliability. Um, not all, but in some. So what would you say to the issues of uh, scalability, reliability? What does that mean for timeline on deployment? I, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing at all that this is where we're going to end up. But how long do you think it will take? And where are we now? I guess I can go ahead. Everyone wants to go ahead. We all, we all jump in. Okay. <laughs> Rochelle, why don't you go first? <laughs> sure. So you know, we mentioned I mentioned at the top of the the webinar that we are partnered with Dish to roll out a five G network that's going to be based on Open RAN, and that's happening in the next few months. We also are on the list of, of possible vendors for the uh, rip and replace program for these small carrier carriers that are taking out their uh, untrusted vendor equipment and replacing that with. Uh, new equipment. And so that is something that we are partnering with. And we were working with the FCC through that Open RAN showcase and through other outreach in order to really roll that out today. So, you know, we talked about the innovation that's happening. I think it's happening while we're doing it. We're learning a lot as we're rolling these things out. And we are going to continue to innovate as we move through it. So I think that it's a continuum. We're at the, at the beginning, but these are real networks that are, are are moving out. We have proof points with Rakuten in, in Japan and you know, the, the Peru uh, example that, that we've been talking about. So, you know, this is not pie in the sky, you know, sort of things, but do we have a road ahead of us where we're going to be learning things? Of course. Yeah, I think, I think what I would say is very similar and kind of reiterate what I said before, it's kind of, it's going to depend on the operator and kind of where they sit, right? So, you know, each operator is going to have their own set of requirements. And, and to the extent that an ORAN architecture can fulfill those requirements, that'll largely dictate, you know, to what extent and when it's going to be deployed. You know, as far as at t goes, you know, we've, we've done several demos and trials of different ORAN-based um, architectures, including working with Comscope and Intel, you know, to demonstrate a millimeter wave 5G, uh, GNOB, and open front hall, leveraging developments at the ORAN Alliance. So we're continuing to work on that. You know, our overall strategy is really to adopt and implement Open RAN you know, into our network as the technology becomes available. Um, that's not going to be an overnight transformation, right? We've been doing a lot of series of tests and trials. That's where I think some of the test beds can be helpful. Um, and then ultimately, we'll integrate it into the network. Um, the, the calculus for an at t might be different than the calculus is for DISH, right? Like, you know, or, or for a Rakuten in Japan or others. You know, at t we have... I think we have somewhere upwards of 180 million connected devices on our network today, right? So we have a very large customer base, a very complex customer base because we have a lot of enterprise business customers. We're also the first net provider. So performance is a critical criteria in terms of how we deploy. And it's not to say that ORAN won't be able to fulfill those performance requirements, but um, you know, it, it's, it's, we have to be really comfortable that it can do that. And I think that's, those are the questions, you know, can you meet those performance requirements at scale, you know, at the same, you know, as um, in order to deliver the expectation, you know, to, to meet your customers' expectations. Those are ultimately the questions that every operator's got to consider. And depending upon where you sit and, and how urban, how dense the networks are, um, your customer mix, those are all going to be factors that folks have to take into consideration. But, you know, my, my expectation is that ORAN will be something that we'll be deploying in the relatively near future. I don't think it's five years out. It's not a decade out. I'm talking within, you know, my understanding, and we put this in our NCIA comments earlier in the year, that you know, some of our C-band um, infrastructure we're putting out is going to be capable of being upgraded to the ORAN specifications by the end of the year. So I think you'll start to see even the big incumbent players start to dabble in ORAN deployments within the next 12 months. And I think you'll see that grow, you know, as, as time goes by and the technology matures. And I'll just add that a better short-term metric 
is every major carrier, whether they're a member of our organization or not, is currently testing open RAN. And that right. should send a huge signal about the industry getting on board. And what are we now, 2021? It's the end of 2021 almost, right? So, you know, we've been talking about this for two years. So when I say dabble in it, I don't know what that's going to mean, but I think you're going to see, like I said, a lot of testing, a lot of different things happening, even from the big incumbent operators. I think, you know, look at what's, frankly, look at what Vodafone and Telefonica, I think uh, Rochelle mentioned this, what they're doing in Europe. They're already deploying in some cases or planning to deploy. So I think there's going to be, um, so I think the technology is getting there. I think it's there in some cases and it's getting there in others. So I think it's going to be an interesting couple of years. Yeah, we didn't have time to talk about the implications of ORAN for capital expenditures and for CapEx. So I think that's something that would be worth looking at later on because there are savings here. Um, I'm gonna do a lightning round because we're down to five minutes. Um, could each of you say what federal policies would best support ORAN? Just really quick one-liners. What would you wanna see Uncle Sam do? So hopefully there'll be agreement. If not, I'll disagree with you, but what federal policies best support ORAN? We need to pass USICA into law, dedicated funding source towards open RAN, and then we need a greater collaboration internationally, more partnerships. Shockingly, I agree with Diane. I don't really have much to add. <laughs> I, I agree with Diane and, and Chris, but I would also add that, uh, again, that prioritization for federal investment in building out greenfields, in broadband connectivity, making sure that we're prioritizing our open RAN innovation to bring these rural and underserved communities along the innovation journey with us. Hmm. Well, those are all good answers. That might be a good note to close on. I mean, I think we there's some financial aspects to ORAN that we didn't get time to talk about. I'm interested in how you're gonna see a mix of uh, commodity compute and cloud and AI uh, work with ORAN to create really the next generations of telecom networks. I think it's a core part. Um, but uh, unless you have any closing remarks you'd like to throw in, I think we, we've pretty much covered the ground. Uh, ORAN, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It is a city in Morocco. I promised I would say that, but we're not talking about that. Um, this has been a good discussion. Any final remarks from anyone? Jim, I think to what you were just saying, like the short answer to your question is all of the above, right? It's yeah. the combination of AI and open architectures and, and uh, machine learning. Like those are, those are going to be things that are incorporated in the networks in the foreseeable future. So that a lot of those things will underpin, not to turn this into a 6G discussion, but those are the types of technologies that will underpin the migration to 6G. So whenever we, Get around having a 6G panel. We could talk more about some of that stuff. Ah, that's actually good because that's the one question I didn't get to. It's the second to last. <laughs> How will ORAN align with the transition to 6G? But we've only got uh, two minutes, three minutes for you to answer that. So you brought it up. I wasn't going to say it. Uh -oh. but, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I mean, ORAN just, I mean, to me, 6G is just going to build on what we're doing with open RAN, yeah. like more disaggregation, more open networks you know, the use of the technology we were just talking about. That's really what's gonna happen. So it's really a continuation of the concepts being introduced through ORAN in some respects. Okay, and the whole series yeah. will be looking at 6G, but go ahead, Diane. Oh, no, I would say every G has been an iteration of the, the last, so this will be no different. Mm -hmm. uh, Rochelle, anything you wanna add on that? You brought, you're the one that brought up 7G, so maybe you could- Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, you know, and now I have to say something about that. You know, I, I think- <laughs> Iteration. I think that it's, it's iteration, but it's also, you know, all the work that we're doing uh, and the, the complementary nature to 5G, you know, we didn't talk about the, the aspect. I know Diane said that, you know, each G has been an iteration, but you know, when you think about what 5G is really going to do, it, it's going from connecting people to devices where we are in 4G to devices to devices, which is the, which is what's going to allow for those autonomous vehicles and telehealth and for smart factories and, and uh, you know, alternative reality. And so we need to be able to open RAN and the software defined open and interoperable network and the innovation that we're going to get out of that and all of the things that I wish I was smart enough to invent to, you know, capitalize on that. That's what we're going to be building on. And that's how open RAN and 5G are going to help us get to 6G and, and all of the wonderful things that, uh, that we don't, we don't even know yet. Well, um, a complex topic. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, there probably is more we could talk about, but we are out of time. 
let me thank uh, Rochelle, Diane, Chris for what I thought was a pretty good discussion of a uh, difficult topic. So with that, thanks to everyone for watching and we'll talk to you at our next uh, ITI event. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.